right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring with the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Gorevsky, and I'll be your host for today. We are right into February. February is always a fun month here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We kick all the men out for the month, and we host amazing women in science, exploration, adventure, and conservation from across North America and around the world. So things are just getting started. If you check your inbox, a new newsletter came out on the weekend highlighting a whole bunch of the live events that we have coming up next. Well, today we're going to join Stephanie Hummel, and she is going to take us on a journey to northwestern Montana to explore Flathead Lake. This is the largest freshwater lake by surface area in the western United States. She is the education coordinator at the Flathead Lake Biological Station and is going to take us into the microscopic world of the lake today. So I'm going to bring her in live with me right now. Hey, Stephanie, how are you doing? Good. How are you? Good, good. It's great to have you joining us live today. Wonderful to join. I'm enjoying that photo back there. That must be a beautiful kind of shot of the lake with some sky there in the background. Oh, absolutely. Late fall sunshine on the lake. Um, much different than what it looks like today. All right. Well, we're excited to take a little deep dive into the lake and get into that microscopic world. So I'm going to let you take over for a little bit and then we'll let the classrooms fire away with a little Q&A action after that. Wonderful. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie Hummel, and I am the education coordinator here at the Flathead Lake Biological Station. So the Flathead Lake Biological Station is actually part of the University of Montana. So that's located a little south of us in Missoula, Montana. So where we're located, state of Montana, in case some of you are calling in from across the nation. So we're up right along the Canadian border. Specifically, Flathead Lake itself is located in northwestern Montana. So you can see on the map here where the red star is, that's where we're located. We're a little bit north of the town of Pulsa, Montana, a little bit south of the town of Kalispell, Montana. And we have actually been located on Flathead Lake since 1899. So we are almost 125 years old. And we are actually one of the oldest active biological stations in the United States. Another thing to note about the Flathead Lake Biological Station is that we are within the Confederate Salish and Kootenai Tribal Reservation. So we always like to acknowledge that we are in the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people, and that we continue to honor the path that they have always shown us in caring for this place and for the generations to come. But what exactly do we do here at the Biological Station? So we actually have a three-part mission. The first part of our mission is that we do all kinds of research. So we have different scientists and professors that work here at the station, and they're mostly working on ecological research. So looking at all the living things in our environment, how they interact with each other, and how they interact with the non-living parts of the environment too. And we also do a lot of research on freshwater since we are located on such a big body of freshwater. A few other projects that our researchers are working on are things like water quality, how healthy is the lake. We're looking at different species and how we can help conserve and keep those species around. Um, at our food web, so how everything connects and how everything's getting energy from everything else. We like to study that and see what's happening in our food web. And then we would have a few scientists that are looking at um, river floodplains, so the rivers that are flowing into and around our lake, as well as looking into some of the tiny parts of our lake, like the microbes, those itty bitty microscopic parts of our waters. The second part of our mission is that we monitor the health of Flathead Lake. So we have been doing this since 1977. So for over 40 years, we've been collecting data out in Flathead Lake. And the data we're looking at are things like the water temperature, how clear is the lake? Um, we're looking at kind of what's living in the lake, how are those species doing? Um, so looking at all kinds of different parts of the lake, the physical, the chemical, the biological parts of our lake. And because we have over 40 years of data, we're able to see if new threats are coming into our waterway. We can see if there's changes in that data that's telling us that there might be a sign that something's happening and we should take action. And then the last part of our mission is that we do education for all. So in the summertime, we actually have lots of college students come to the station. They live on site in cabins, and then they come here and take coursework. So that's coursework where they go out on the lake and collect data. They might actually even go up 
into the mountains around here and go to some of those high mountain lakes and collect data from those. And they get to learn out in the field. So it's a really exciting experience for them. But we also have our K through 12 program, which I manage. So that's bringing students here to the bio station for a field trip with our high schoolers. You can see in that photo, we take them out in boats and we actually collect the data out on site. We also go out into local community host events, and then we will go into classrooms as well to teach about our lake and our watershed. And we're all really lucky that we all get to perform these jobs that make up the bio station here on beautiful Flathead Lake. And Flathead Lake is a really special lake. It is one of the largest freshwater lakes west of the Mississippi. So we are considered the largest freshwater lake in the west by surface area. So that just means it takes a really long time to drive around Flathead Lake, about two hours or so, or so to drive all the way around. But there's one of the lake that actually tries to fight with us for that title for the largest freshwater lake in the West, and that's Lake Tahoe. They beat us by volume. So they're a lot deeper. They hold more water, but we're bigger by surface area. Something else that's unique about Flathead Lake is the fact that it's a really, really clear lake. So if you stick your foot in the lake and you go swimming in there, you can see your foot all the way down in the water. So this is a very clear lake. And there's a few things that help make our lake so clear. One of them is where the water starts before it flows into our lake. And a lot of the water here in Flathead Lake is coming from protected areas, places like Glacier National Park, the Flathead National Forest, um, Bob Marshall Wilderness, and other protected lands. So a lot of that water is coming from protected places is already really clear and clean coming into our lake. Also, all of our rocks and the geology around us doesn't have many nutrients. And when I say nutrients, I'm talking about things like nitrogen and phosphorus. Those are um, nutrients that plants will use to help them grow. And when you put that in water, it can also help algae grow and it kind of clouds up the surface of the water. We don't have a lot of those nutrients in our rock. So that means not a lot of that is coming into our lake. Another thing that's unique about Flathead Lake that keeps it clear is the fact that there's not many people living around here. Around the whole greater Flathead Lake area, there's about 100,000 people. That's not many for such a big lake. So that means there's a little less pollution coming in. And then also water doesn't stay in Flathead Lake for very long. So when water enters the lake at the very north end of the lake in this picture, you can see around that town of Big Fork by the Swan River, by the Flathead River, it only stays in Flathead Lake for about 2.2 years before it flushes all the way through and exits around the town of Polson. That's really fast. For other lakes, to compare it for Lake Tahoe, water stays in Lake Tahoe for about 650 years before it leaves. So the fact that we have this fast flushing rate helps keep our water really clear. And just to give you a better idea of what Flathead Lake looks like, I'm gonna play this video right here. And as we're watching this video, this is drone footage of Flathead Lake. As we're watching this, I want you to think about maybe a lake or a pond that's closer to where you all live. And I want you to think about what are some things that you find in common, some similarities between Flathead Lake and a lake near you, and what are some differences? If you look at that lower portion of the shoreline here and those buildings you can see right around the shore in the dock, that's actually where we're located. So we're located at Yellow Bay and those are our office buildings. So we have a great spot on the lake to do our research. So as you can see in that footage, our lake is very, very large. And one of the interesting things that a lot of our researchers here study at the Flathead Lake Biological Station is what exactly lives in Flathead Lake? So I want you to think for a moment, maybe you're from around this area so you have a better idea, or maybe you live somewhere else in the country or in another country. I want you to think about what might live in Flathead Lake. And I want you to add those to the chat. So a lot of times when people think about what lives in Flathead Lake, they're thinking about things like big fish species that they might like to catch, those really eye-catching animals, maybe some certain ducks might live in and around here. But really one of the main focuses that our researchers have and interest they have is on the smaller parts of what lives in our lake. And those smaller parts are things that we call plankton. 
So it's the tiny microscopic parts of our waters that are floating and drifting with the tides. So it's really kind of the tides and the waves that are pushing these little guys around. And for our plankton, they're actually broken into two different categories. One category is phytoplankton. That's the plant-like version of plankton. So you can see right here, these are phytoplankton. They come in many different shapes. And for our phytoplankton, since they are the plant-like version of plankton, they create their own energy through photosynthesis. So that means that they need to be able to access the sun to get that energy to make their own food. So our phytoplankton are typically found at the top part of our waters in the lake. That's just so they're in the spot that the sunlight still reaches, so they're able to photosynthesize and create their own energy. Now on the other hand, their other type of plankton, or zooplankton, the animal version of plankton, they can be found all across the lake because they don't have to create their own energy. They actually get their own in energy by eating the phytoplankton. So you can see these guys come in all different shapes and sizes. If you look at this picture here, the ones in the bottom, those are our smallest. You absolutely need a microscope to see them. If you go up a level to the copepods, you can see them with your eye, but they look like little specks of dust. The next level up, the cladocera, you can actually see those decently well when you're looking at them, kind of squinting at them. And then our mice shrimp at the top, those are our largest zooplankton, and you can see those pretty well with your own eye. So our plankton play a really important role in our lake. They are at the bottom of our food web. So the phytoplankton are the very bottom, creating their own energy to feed the zooplankton. And then the zooplankton start feeding our fish. So all of those young fish will rely on our zooplankton to get their food. And that's the reason why many of our researchers and our scientists are so interested in our plankton is because without our plankton, a lot of the other species wouldn't be able to survive in our lake. So today we're going to take a closer look at these plankton and we're actually going to look at them under the microscope. But before we begin, I want you to start thinking about how in the world would you collect such a tiny living thing? Because our scientists routinely go out in the lake and they collect samples of the phytoplankton, of the zooplankton. But how would you do that? Well, how our scientists collect these plankton species in the lake is they use something called a plankton net. And it's gonna be pictured right here with our scientist, Jim, and one of his student helpers. And you'll kind of see how this works. So you can see she has this mesh net here. That gets lowered down into the lake. It has a little jar container at the bottom and that gets pulled through water. And as that water's traveling through the net, that water can come in, go through, come out through the net, but all of that plankton it's actually larger than the holes in the net, so it gets trapped inside of the net. So what Jim is doing here is he was kind of washing off the net, getting the plankton into that container, and he's shaking out that extra water. Why they shake out that extra water is because they want a super concentrated sample of plankton. So that just means lots and lots of plankton in one area. So if you shake out that water, you're going to have more plankton in that sample. Now, Jim just passed off that sample to another one of our scientists here, Jim. So what Jim is going to do is he's going to show you how we pre prepare it to then send it back to the lab. And the lab is where our scientists will actually count those samples. They count what species of plankton they find in the sample and how many. So you'll notice Jim just added a little bit of um, carbonated water or soda water. And basically what that does is it slows those plankton down and kind of causes them to freeze in the water. So when you take that back into lab and counting them under the microscope, when they're slowed down and not really moving, it's a whole lot easier to count them than if you were trying to count them when they're still moving. So that right there is the sample that they'll take back to lab. You can see it's kind of orange in color. It shows you that there's a lot of plankton there. So here is an example of what a sample of plankton looks like that our researchers collect. So you can see there's lots and lots of tiny little plankton floating in that jar. So, so many of them concentrated in one area. And what we're going to do right now is we are actually going to take a look at a microscope and look at some of these plankton. Let me pull up my microscope here. Hopefully we'll see a variety of plankton. I can already see some. So you'll notice on our microscope here, and just to note, we are looking at, it's about a 
it's 40 X. So that means it's 40 times stronger than what your own eye can see. So we are really zoomed in on these guys. One thing I'd like to point out is if you notice those star like shapes that we see on our microscope, that's a type of phytoplankton. It's a type of phytoplankton that we call Asterianella. Um, it's a common one that we'll definitely see a lot in the springtime. We're starting to see some now as well when we collected this sample. Oh, here we go. You'll see some plankton moving in and out of the sample as we go. So right here we have a type of zooplankton. So you may recognize them from when we were looking at that chart of the zooplankton. This is a copepod. So they're one of those plankton, those zooplankton that are basically appear like little specks of dust when you're looking at them with your own naked eye. But once you put them under the microscope, you can see them a whole lot better. Let's keep scrolling around and see if we come across any other types of plankton here. We sometimes get lucky and get that small, small species, the denobrian and those rotifers. I actually do see some of our denobrian right here. So if you look towards the center, towards that black spot, you'll notice that's another type of phytoplankton. That's our denobrian, kind of almost looks like a strand of wheat. We see some more right there. Let's see if we can catch some more of these copepods. They can be pretty tricky because we're looking at them under a slide where they can still move in the water, so they're moving around a lot. So we'll see if we can catch any more. And you might notice some of those black circles on our slide. Those are just air bubbles. see a bunch over on this side of our slide. Let's see if we can focus in on them. So here's another one of the copepod. You notice they have those really long antennae. Oh, and they just suddenly disappear from our screen. So they're very, very fast. So now you can see why we would want, and our scientists would want to put that soda water in and slow them down when they're having to count these species, because otherwise they just disappear before they could even give a good count. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to switch over our view on our microscope to a different type of zooplankton that we find in Flathead Lake. Now this is the type of zooplankton called a cladocera. So that's the one that you can actually see with your own eye. It's very, very tiny. So this right here is a cladocera called Daphnia. And Daphnia, you'll see kind of this black edge coming in. That's just an ear, some of the water bubble coming through here. Um, so our Daphnia are a really important type of zooplankton. That's a species, since they are slightly larger, that our other fish like to eat. What I think is cool about our Daphnia is the fact that you can actually see their body parts inside of them. So if you take a look at our Daphnia, you can see all kinds of really cool body parts on this guy. You might notice that there's something on that upper back side of our Daphnia that kind of looks like it's beating and moving. That's our Daphnia's heart. So that heart, you can see it's really pumping hard right now. Another thing you might notice is that black circle that's at the top of our Daphnia. That's its eye. So our Daphnia, they have a compound eye. So you can see that kind of eye is moving a little bit on its stalk. Probably why it's moving so much right now is because the light of the microscope shining down on it. It's probably not the, you know, not exactly what the Daphnia wants right now, that light. Another thing you'll notice, do you see this long tube kind of extending along its back? Well, that is our Daphnia's intestine. So that's the food is coming in at the mouth at the top and it's coming all the way through their body and the intestine. And you'll notice the intestine's a little bit green. Why that intestine is green is because they eat phytoplankton. That phytoplankton's green in color. So their intestine is then going to be green as well. One other feature on our Daphnia that I'd like to point out is you'll notice on the top, it's kind of arm-like things that are sticking up by its eye. Those are a set of their antennae. So they actually have two different sets of antennae. 
They have one really small one we can't see back by their mouth. That kind of helps them sense their surroundings, kind of see what's in their surroundings. The ones that we see on top, those are actually, they help them more lo with mo locomotion. So that can help them kind of move up and down in the water. Of course, if a big wave comes in, that wave is going to move them, but that can help them go up and down a little bit. So those are some of the kind of the unique features over Daphnia. That whole area around the Daphnia's body is called their carapace because they're actually an invertebrate. So they don't have a spine like you and I. So they're kind of unique little creatures. Well, one last thing I want to point out before we wrap things up is why do we care about Daphnia? Why do we care about copepods? Why do we care about these plankton species? Well, like I mentioned before, without these species, we would not be able to have the fish species that we have in Flathead Lake. You'll notice on our little food web here, the phytoplankton, that plant version of plankton, they fall at the bottom. Those cladoceras like our Daphnia, those copepods that we saw under the microscope, those are eating the phytoplankton, they're feeding the fish. Without these tiny, tiny microscopic parts of our world, we wouldn't have fish. We wouldn't have some of the birds and other cool animals that live around Flathead Lake. So for any of you, if you like to swim, if you like to fish, if you like to spend time on the water, next time you go to a lake or a pond, I want you to think about the smaller parts of what might be living in the lake. And think of plankton, because they do a lot for our food web and for all of us. All right. <clears throat> well, Stephanie, thank you so much for sharing with us. Uh, it is very easy to overlook those little heroes in the lake who form that base of the food chain because we can't see them. So we don't get to see all the time that role that they play. But you're right. If we just look around and everything we like about the lake, the fish, uh, the birds, the reptiles, the amphibians, they're all thanks to those tiny little heroes in the lake. So very cool. Thanks for zooming in and letting us take a look at their world for a few minutes. Oh, absolutely. All right. Well, what we're going to do now is while you were presenting, I prepared a little Kahoot quiz in the background. So how we're going to play that today is I am going to put a link up and you can head over to that link and it's going to ask you for a pin number. I'm going to share my screen and put that pin number up as well. If you have one-to-one -one devices, then absolutely, you can do it right at your seat with something like a Chromebook or a tablet or even a mobile device. If you don't, your teacher could pop it up at the front of the room and you could shout out your answers to him or her and you could still participate that way. So uh, let me share my screen here and let us get this Kahoot in action. All right, Chrome tab. Okay, here it is. So the pin number for today is going to be um, 7547513. So if you go to kahoot.it, it's then going to ask you for this pin number and you can put that pin number in. If you have a mobile device or a tablet handy, you could just scan that QR code up at the top. Uh, if you are not able to join in to the Kahoot with a device, just shout out your answers in the classroom um it's no big deal if you can't come and join us directly so we'll give a couple little minutes here and see if a couple classrooms or a couple students are able to come in and join uh the kahoot quiz and then we will take things live and see what we learned about flathead lake and of course our little friends that we find in flathead lake so if you are a classroom you could just put this up at the front of the room if you don't have individual devices and it looks like today we might uh, have classrooms joining as a whole instead of uh, individual students, which is just fine. Uh, and you can compete against these other classrooms. And of course, shout out your answers to your teacher to help get them where we want them. We'll give another couple seconds, see if another couple classrooms uh, are able to come and take a spot. Uh, and then we will jump in. So there's some true and false today. There is some uh, multiple choice. Quicker you get that answer in, you have 20 seconds, the more points you're gonna get. Um, the longer it takes, the less points. And then of course, if you get the answer wrong, we got no points for you. You gotta get it right and you gotta get it right nice and quick. So I think we have a few classrooms here ready to go and shout out their answers. So let's go ahead. Oh, a few more. 
All right, let's get it going. So our first question, a nice warm up question, a true and false about Flathead Lake. Flathead Lake Biological Station is one of the oldest operating in the United States. Is that true or is that false? True or false, it is one of the oldest operating in the United States. Got five more seconds to get an answer in. All right, good job crew. That is absolutely true. Good start. Let's see what our leaderboard looks like. The knowing Newt is in first place right now. Stephanie, would we find Newts in Flathead Lake? Do you find Newts? That's a great question. You know, I'm actually not certain for Newt species. There might, mm, if they are in the state of Montana, if there are some, that's a great question. I am not certain on that one. All right, we will put our students to the task then and have them do a little Google search afterwards. All right, our second question, which below is part of the mission of the station? Do they explore the biology of the lake? Do they study the water health of the lake? Do they educate others about the lake or all of the above? So what answer are you gonna pick? Are they out there doing the biology? Are they looking at the health of the lake? Are they educating others? or getting in on all of that action. All right, good job, crew. Uh, always read the answers because sometimes we'll trick you by having that answer at the end. So even though the first one looks really good, maybe the second one looks really good, maybe they're all looking pretty good. So the new, knowing Newt is still holding down that top spot. Let's go to our next question, another true and false. Flathead Lake is really murky. It's hard to see into the water. Is that true or false? That Flathead Lake was really murky. Who remembers what Stephanie told us about the water uh, in Flathead Lake? You've got a few more seconds to lock in an answer and then we'll see how we did. All right, we know that's false. It's a nice clear lake and we learned about so many different reasons from the water sources to the geology of the rocks how long that water's hanging out in there. So we learned a lot about why that water stays so clear. Our next question is, plankton uses photosynthesis too. Does it clean the lake? Does it take pictures of the environment? Does it make energy from the sun? Or is it use photosynthesis to capture food to eat? So what is that plankton doing with photosynthesis? Cleaning the lake, taking pictures, making energy, or capturing food? All right, good job crew. It is using that sunlight to make energy just like our plants do on land. Photosynthesis is really, really cool. Um, and as you get a little bit older too, you'll learn more about it in your biology and your science. The knowing Newt is not letting go of that top spot. Let's see if something happens at the end. So zooplankton is the animal version of plankton. Is that true or false? Zooplankton is the animal version of plankton. We've got a few more seconds to get that in. And like plankton, I bet the zooplankton is pretty darn important for the food chain too. But let's see how we do. All right, that is true. Good job, crew. Let's take a look at our final board. We've got the quick emu in third place. The diligent gecko in second and holding down that top spot. All right, the knowing Newt was able to go tape to tape, wire to wire, uh, and finish off in first place. All right, so let's come back from that screen share, and let's go to a little Q&A action. If you are tuning in via YouTube, now's the time to use that chat bar and send me some questions there, and I will share them uh, with Stephanie, and then I will also take questions from the classroom. So let's start with one from YouTube before I bring in some camera groups. Stephanie, what made you decide to study and work at Flathead Lake? Oh, that's a great question. So I actually have been living around this area and working around this area for years. Um, but it was the fact that I got to work with kids every day and work with local scientists and connect the two. And I think that's really cool. The fact that we get to bring students out onto Flathead Lake to study what's in the lake, study how we protect this lake, but also work with the scientists who are working hand in hand to help protect this. So I think that kind of cool blend of the science 
scientists working with students was a really unique option opportunity. All right, very cool. Uh, okay, let's bring in a classroom who's not too far from you. We've got a crew hanging out here in Montana, Miss Sinclair's second graders. I think they're in Kalispell, so they're not far at all. Mm -hmm. How are we doing today, everybody? Good. Hunter, come back and have a seat. Good to see you. Before I get a question, put your hands up if you've ever been to Flathead Lake. Oh, <laughs> oh awesome. <very> cool. <laughs> so we probably have some Flathead Lake experts here, but we'd love to get some of your questions. Let's start with two. Two yeah. questions. Um, why are um, plankton so tiny? What was that question? Why are plankton so tiny? Ooh, why are plankton so tiny? So they're just, they don't have very big bodies at all. Um, so that just makes them really, really tiny. You know, they, um, like, you know, fish, they're eating lots and lots of other things to get bigger. Well, the plankton, those phytoplankton, they're just making their own foods. So they're itty bitty and they just have to take that energy from the sun. The zooplankton, they're not much bigger either because they're just eating those tiny, tiny bits of the phytoplankton. So that's why they just stay so tiny. They're just not eating a lot like those other species. Thank you. All right. Good question. Who's got another one? Let's steal another one. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, who discovered plankton? Who discovered plankton? Oh, that is a great question. You know, I actually don't know that answer off the top of my head. Um, it's a great question as to who discovered it when, because I know we've got plankton in the oceans. We've got plankton in different freshwater lakes. So that'd be really an interesting question to look into. Mm -hmm. I looked it up online and maybe I'll share it uh, before we wrap up today, but classrooms might want to look it up too. But we do have an answer and I'll tell you that it was well over a hundred years ago. So we'll, we'll maybe share that, maybe share that answer a little bit towards the end. All right. Oh, I think I see someone up there. So let's grab one more before we go to another group. Uh, is it possible to see the bottom of the Flathead Lake? It depends where you're at in Flathead Lake. So if you're in some of those bays and those shallow areas, you can absolutely go out there. Maybe you're only about, say, like 14 feet. It's 14 feet deep. You can definitely see the bottom of the lake. But if you're at the deepest point, which is about 380 feet, you would not see the bottom from if you're on a boat up top. So it just kind of depends where you're at and how shallow that part of the water is. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll try to swing back your way for a couple more. But let's go to another class we have joining us. Uh, Ms. Barha's group is joining us backstage. They are, I believe they're in California. Uh, so let me just double check that. Yes, Oxnard, California. Let me bring them in front and center. We got them on mic today. How are we doing, Oxnard? How are we doing? They're all on mute. <laughs> That's okay. Are they are they joining us virtually today? Yes. Perfect. All right. Who's got a question? Does anybody have a question? You can unmute and ask your question. Mia, do you have a question? What is the largest species of zooplankton? Ooh, so the largest species of zooplankton that we find in Flathead Lake is our mysis shrimp. So they're actually a non-native species of zooplankton. They were brought into this area in the 1900s, and they actually weren't introduced into Flathead Lake. They were introduced to lakes north of us, but they eventually came down into Flathead Lake through our rivers. So that's the largest species we find in our lake. Now, if you compare it to other lakes in like the ocean, the ocean, there's very, very large zooplankton compared to ours. Um, I can't tell you the specific names of those like in the ocean, but for us, our largest species is the mysia shrimp in our lake. All right, good question. Do you have another one hiding out there? I have a question. So how, when you go into the lake, how deep are, do you, you know, do you find these microorganisms? Are they all over? You know, it doesn't matter how deep I'm in the lake or do I have to go in deeper? I'm oh, that's sorry. a great question. So that sample that I was showing us today with our copepods, that was actually, I just collected that sample this morning and I basically collected it from the top surface of water. So I just threw a plankton net out, pulled it in. It was less than a foot deep in the water. So oh, you can wow. find those copepods everywhere. For things like our Daphnia, that last zooplankton I was showing, typically we find them in our water like um, summer into fall. 
The sample I was showing was actually a population we keep in our lab because we don't see a lot of them in the winter. Mm -hmm. And those we normally pick a better sample and get a better sample when we're about 10 to about, um, you know, about 10 to 20 feet or so down in the water. So they do hang a little bit deeper in the water. Now that phytoplankton, they're going to be in the photic zone. So kind of the top layer of that water. So if you go deep down in the lake, you're not going to find the phytoplankton. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, they need that sun. Awesome questions. So a uh, question came in here via the chat when you mentioned those shrimp. So I think usually when we think of invasive species, we think about bigger things, but, you know, small things can be moved around in, you know, bilges of boats and on shoes and things like that. Did the shrimp have any kind of impact on the lake or has it been so long that they're just kind of part of the ecosystem now? Oh, this is a very, very good question. And a lot of research has happened here at the bio station over the decades about this. So the shrimp have actually had a huge impact on our lake. They were intentionally brought here to feed an already non-native species of fish that was in the lake. They ended up actually making that population of fish crash, the kokanee salmon. That population basically disappeared when the mysis shrimp were introduced. It also changed what, um, how many and kind of what types of zooplankton we were seeing with the different types of like cladocera in the lake. And then those mysis shrimp, they actually became really good food for another type of invasive fish, lake trout in our lake. So that kind of helped those lake trout, the population expand as well. So they've definitely had a huge impact, impact in the lake. They're still in our lake. They're unfortunately impossible to remove at this point. So we keep studying to see how things change over time. All right. Huh, that's interesting. And then of course, feeding the invasive species and helping them uh, uh, spread. So. There's lots of stories like that. You can look at the cane toads in Australia uh, as a good example, where we try to bring something uh, to help out and we try to bring something else to get the thing that we brought to help out. It's just not good to mess around with those ecosystems. Oh, absolutely. All right. Uh, Miss Sinclair's crew, let's bring you back in here. Go ahead, Rex. Where did plankton come from? Where did plankton come from? So they evolved over time. I don't know when they evolved, but um, they evolved from kind of some of our, you know, smallest living things on earth. Um, yeah, that's a really tough question because those small, uh, you know, single celled organisms were some of the first life on earth. So they'd be ancestors of some of that first life. So yeah, that's a, Really good question to think about, but a really hard question to answer. Thank and I you. bet that something like plankton uh, is tricky to find in fossils too. So that probably makes it a little bit tricky to figure out when they first appeared. All right. Do we have another one there? Go ahead, Hunter. Um, have you saved any animals? <laughs> oh, the station. Has the biological station ever saved any animals? Oh, have we ever saved any animals? Um, I mean, we've been able to provide data that kind of shows what's happening in our lake, what we're seeing with changes in species. And I think that has gone on to help some of the other organizations around here who actually make changes to things mm -hmm. that people do has helped them save some species like our bull trout species, our native fish, mm -hmm. their population's been disappearing. And we're not seeing a whole lot of bull trout. And a lot of that has to do with those non-native lake trout. They like to eat a lot of the food that the bull trout eat, take away their habitat. So we've been able to provide some data that kind of shows things like that. And then that helps people in turn decide what do we need to do to help protect these species? All right. That's a very cool question. And we, we connect sometimes with places like the Toucan Rescue Ranch in Costa Rica, where they go out and they find native wildlife that's in trouble they help them and then release them back into the wild. But good science can do the same thing, but on an even bigger scale. So mm -hmm. helping whole ecosystems by making changes and stopping practices that might be putting pollution or, or overfishing and things like that. So good science is really important and a good way to save species as well. I like your question, second graders. Pretty cool. All right. Uh, Ms. Barha's group, let's check in one more time and see if we have another question before uh, we wrap up for today. Okay, Jake. You have any plankton that are like a hundred years old or something? 
oh, do we have any plankton that are like very, very old? Well, plankton, they don't live very long. They're so tiny. So like that Daphne I showed you, that bigger um, plankton, the last one we looked at, you know, if they live two months, that's pretty good for a plankton. So we're unfortunately never going to see a specific plankton that's, you know, over like a year old or anything like that. They have very short lifespans. All right. Good question. You can squeak in one more if there's one there. Daniel, do you want to ask your question? Uh, what's the oldest painting in your, in your lake? Okay. What's the oldest plankton we have in the lake? So like I mentioned, they don't live very long. So you're probably looking at some that are maybe, you know, a couple months old, if that. Um, so not very old at all. Yeah. And so a question coming in here via the chat, because you mentioned that uh, during the winter, there's certain ones you can't find. So what's going on? Are the plankton still doing their thing beneath the ice when the winter comes? So definitely like those copepods we were looking at, you find them year round in the lake. So even when it ices over, which Flathead Lake, it doesn't ice completely over since it's such a big lake. It's rare. You know, you maybe see that like once in a decade. Um, our bay will ice over. Um, we started to see it ice over a little bit this week, but they're still living under the lake. Um, things like our Daphnia, they just do better in the summer and fall. The temperatures are just better. Um, their food sources are better. So they just start to kind of disappear. You don't see as many of them in the lake at all. Um, some of them will actually lay some um, resting eggs that will actually then hatch the next spring. So then that starts the population back up. Um, so some species are year round. Other species just try to kind of disappear when our, when the conditions don't get very good. Like right now our lake's about 34 degrees. So not very easy to survive out there. All right, very cool. Well, I hope that some of the classrooms joining us today are inspired. Maybe when it gets a little bit warmer in the springtime to go out and take some water samples uh, and look at them under your microscopes and see some of that small life that we don't pay much attention to, I think, uh, on any given day. But it is so darn important for everything we're doing right now, from the air we breathe to a lot of the food that we eat. So we don't want to forget about our small life. So Stephanie, thank you for taking us into Flathead Lake and showing us some of that zooplankton and plankton that, that forms that base of the food chain that's so important. Of course. Thank you all for joining today. All right. Let's bring in our second graders for a Thank you. Ms. Marha's class, if you want to mute your mics, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our online YouTube classrooms. And we are going to sign off for today. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye.